so today's uh, topic is uh, multipole expansion uh, fact once you define the concept of electrical potential i believe this is the most important topic in uh, electrostatics because you have this definition so using principle of superposition you can define potential given some arbitrary charge distribution you can define the potential in the form of this integral but question is uh, can you evaluate this integral well you may say that okay with modern fast computers yes you give me any charge distribution i'll do the numerical integration and give you whatever answer you want in principle that's a valid answer but uh, the techniques i'm going to describe they were developed about 150 years ago when there were no modern computers but even today when we have these fast computers which can do numerical calculations it is worth our while to learn these techniques because well number 1 they allow us to do analytic calculations so that whenever you have an analytic formula you roughly know the behavior of the analytic formula and you can imagine how the solution would look and more importantly when you want to design things and one of the important problems in uh, modern physics is to design effective particle accelerators for various different applications and you need sort of extreme precision to make these particles move in the desired orbit and in order to make them move in that precise orbit you will actually find that you need to use techniques like this where you split the problem into smaller into a number of smaller problems and you first ask okay the largest piece how does it affect my solution and it affects it in certain way but it doesn't quite go the way i want it's going a little off so then i'll say okay what kind of correction do i need to apply to make it move from here to here and so the next piece of the problem will tell me how to apply that correction and get the part get those charges moving along the direction i want so as i said even though with modern computers one can evaluate this integral the techniques that i am describing today they will still be useful in solving even modern day problems effectively but first before we discuss this multipole expansion let us consider this problem you all know what happens if i put a ch point charge at origin and what the potential is but now instead of one point charge 
I have two point charges. Suppose I have two charges, one plus Q, which is at the point 0, 0, D by 2, and the other minus Q at 0, 0, minus D by 2. And I want to calculate the potential at a point reasonably far away from where the charges are. Well, one simple way of saying it is, oh, this charge plus Q is at a distance R, minus Q is also at a distance roughly R, so that potentials U to the 2 cancel off. Well, yes, they do. But the point is, they do not exactly cancel out because the distance from plus q to the point where I am calculating the potential, that distance I call r plus and that is not exactly equal to the distance between minus q to the point where I am calculating the potential. So, I have 1 over r plus minus 1 over r minus, they nearly cancel, but they do not exactly cancel. So, if I work it out, this r plus is this r, r is the distance from the origin to the point where I am calculating the potential. In fact, the coordinates of this point I describe by the vector r. Then the, this r plus is r square plus d by 2 whole square minus r d cos theta, where theta is the angle between the z axis and r. Note that in this problem, the problem statement itself is defining a preferential axis that is the unit vector from minus q to plus q. Therefore, the z axis is automatically defined for me in this problem. And so, this cos theta is also defined. So, r plus is given by this expression and r minus is instead of a minus, there is a plus here and I will do binomial expansion. I hope all of you have seen binomial expansion for negative coefficients, negative powers and fractional powers. So, it is a series and so, I have 1 over r times 1 minus d by r cos theta plus d square by r square power minus half. That is what this term turns out to be. I pull out an r square and because of the square root it becomes r and then the rest of the terms follow. And I keep only the leading term in d by r and ignore everything else and if I do so, then this is 1 over r times 1 over d by 2r cos theta. This, oh sorry, this is plus, this is 1 over r plus and 1 over r minus turns out to be
and if you take the difference between these two, the leading terms, the 1 over r is indeed cancelling out as we expect, but the subleading terms they are adding and I get the following potential. One very important point. For a point charge, if I go far away from the point charge, potential falls off as 1 over r. But in this case, which we call a dipole, if I go far away, potential is falling away as 1 over r square. So, certainly this is a much weaker potential compared to what I have if I have a point charge. Suppose instead of considering this problem, I consider this problem. The charge at 0, 0 d by 2 is 2 q, but the charge at 0, 0 minus d by 2 is minus q. Then what happens? Well, the net charge in this region now is q and if I move far away, the put, this net charge close to the origin q is still there because of which I will see a potential q by r and in addition I will see a correction due to this distribution which goes as 1 over r square. So, if I consider this problem, there will be two terms in my potential. First term will go as 1 over r and second term will go as 1 over r square. So, if I move far enough away from the origin, maybe I can neglect the 1 over r square term compared to the 1 over r term. But on the other hand, if instead of if this is plus q not plus 2 q, then the leading term is cancelling out. So, simple way we make approximations. If there is a 1, you will neglect point 1, but if the leading term is 0, you cannot neglect point 1. I mean, if you want to talk in terms, in terms of money, suppose you have 100 rupees in your pocket and a friend comes and says, can I borrow 10 rupees? You don't mind lending 10 rupees to the friend. But if you have 10 rupees in your pocket and from friend comes and says, give me that 10 rupees, then obviously you don't want to give it up. To some extent, that is what we are doing here. We are comparing two terms. If the first term is large, then we will neglect the second term. But if the first term itself is 0, we cannot afford to neglect the second term. We have to keep it. So, when I have a plus q and minus q separated by a small distance, I cannot say that the potential is 0. I have to say that potential goes as 1 over r square and in addition it also has this cos theta dependence. And here we did the problem for a simple charge distribution involving two charges, two point charges, but now let us do this in a general case. I write the most general potential for the most general charge distribution and now this denominator 
is r square plus r prime square minus 2 r dot r prime uh, power half or I will actually write not denominator 1 over denominator so this becomes minus half. Now I will make an assumption. I will assume that I mean even without this assumption I can do the analysis but it is better if I make the assumption that there is something in this charge distribution which allows me to define a z axis. But okay, let me not make that assumption, let me just carry it out and this r dot r prime I will write as to r r prime cos theta prime where theta prime is the angle between the position vector r and the vector r prime i think yeah let's not worry about z axis i think this is better so there is an origin i'm defining the origin that's all I am doing. So, from the origin to the point where I am measuring the potential, I have the vector r and from the origin to the point where the small element of volume which I am considering as source, there is a vector r prime and between vector r prime and vector r, there is an angle theta, theta prime. So, that r dot r prime is cos theta prime. I will write this as 1 over r times 1 plus epsilon power minus half where epsilon is r prime by r times minus 2 cos theta prime plus r prime by r. So, I pull out r square. So, this here then becomes r prime by r cos theta prime and this is r prime by square or <coughs> r prime square by r square. So, I take out this factor r prime by r out. So, I have this and the fact that I am designing this, I am I have designated this quantity by the symbol epsilon is should already give you a hint that I will consider the approximation r prime much much less than r so that epsilon is a small quantity. So, pictorially what that means is the following. So, I am defining the two vectors r and r prime which means I am defining an origin and charge density is non-zero in a small region around the origin. So, the assumption I am making is that there is some arbitrary charge, but the charge is localized in a not in a very big region. Let us say the charge is localized in a region of 1 centimeter cube, then the what I am doing is valid 
only if I look at that charge from a distance of 1 meter or longer. If I look at it from a distance of 5 centimeters, then the manipulations I am going to do, they are not valid. So, pictorially, this is what I am thinking of, that there is a small volume, not microscopic, but a small volume in which the charge is localized. Now, if I do the binomial expansion, I have 1 minus epsilon by 2 plus 3 by 8 epsilon square and what is the next term? What is the next term in this expansion? Minus 5 by 16 epsilon cube plus dot dot dot. And now I substitute for this epsilon and note the following. my small quantity strictly speaking is r prime by r not epsilon epsilon is r prime by r multiplied by two terms where this term can be large whereas of course it can be zero also but most for most values of theta prime this is large Whereas, r prime by r by definition is small. So, in this expansion, what I should do? I should not leave this expansion like this. I should substitute for epsilon, epsilon square, epsilon cube, etcetera, and then rewrite them, rewrite the terms in powers of r prime by r. If I do that, you find that something quite remarkable happens. I have 1 minus epsilon by 2, but by the way, the, the first order term in r prime by r comes only from here and that is plus r prime by r cos theta. Now, when it comes to r prime square by r square, it will come from two places, one from here and one from here. So, I have uh, plus r prime square by r square or plus r prime square by r square times. Let us first consider coming from epsilon that is minus half and from epsilon square I will get this from here. So, that is times 4 cos square theta prime plus r prime by r whole cube. Now, where do I get the terms? One will come from epsilon square which comes due to the interference of these two, there is a r prime square by r square in front and then interference of these two will give me one term. So, that is 3 by 8 times minus 4, is that correct? Yeah. Huh? 
I am collecting powers of R prime by R. So that's the term that what you just talked about. That's the term I am going to write now. So that will be four cos theta prime. And then, is that correct? 3 by 8 times square of this, yeah. And then, next will come from here, epsilon cube. So, this cube times this cube, so I will get plus or uh, rather minus 5 by 16 times minus 8 cos cube theta prime and do I get a cos theta also when I do this, when I take the epsilon cube, there is a cos cube theta and O. Oh. Sorry? Here, there is a, there should be a 3 by 2, yeah I put the 3 by 8, yeah I think this is the only term that will be there, there will be no other term which will contribute to R prime by R whole Q. Because when I take epsilon cube, already I am getting an r prime by r whole cube in front, which means the only term I should consider is this term. And now, if you add them up, plus And this can be written as sum over n from 0 to infinity r prime by r power n of course I have done only up to this term but those of you who are adventurous, you can go to fourth power and make sure that you actually get P4 cos theta. So, remember my potential I have written as 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times 1 over r integral rho of r prime d tau prime times 1 plus epsilon power half. 
here i had mod of r minus r prime that mod of that mod of r, r minus r prime i pull the r out and the this volume integral is over the volume with where the charge is non zero and the variable of integration is r prime so i can pull r out of the integral and therefore the integral now is rho of r prime d tau prime divided by 1 plus epsilon power half and i have just shown you that 1 over 1 plus epsilon power half can be written in this form therefore this potential is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times 1 over r times sum over n equal to 0 to infinity r prime by r power n p n cos theta. P n cos theta prime d tau prime. Yeah. So when n equal to zero, you have r prime power zero, that is one and of course p n cos theta p 0 cos theta is also 1 and I have integral rho of r prime d tau prime which, which is the total charge in the charge distribution and potential due to that goes as the total charge by r as I mentioned before. So by the way this is what we call the multipole expansion. So, this V of R I write as V naught of R plus V one of R plus v2 of r plus v3 of r plus dot dot dot. Strictly speaking, it is an infinite series and v0 of r is called the monopole term and this is given by 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q of r where this q is integral rho of r prime d tau prime. Now let us consider the second term in the expansion. Is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught 1 over r square integral rho of r prime times r prime cos theta prime d tau prime. I will rewrite this as R Q times R R prime or uh, and 
then you see that this is r minus r prime. So, r I define a quantity called dipole moment By the way, the charge is called the monopole moment is equal to integral rho of r prime, r prime, d tau prime. So, and I denote it by the vector small p, then the second term in the expansion is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, 1 over r cube times r dot p, or p I am using small p. But I choose to write it actually as 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught r hat by small p by r squared. So, this is the our philosophy in doing this multipole expansion, I have a charge distribution. Given the charge distribution, first I compute this quantity, just simple integral, simple volume integral of the charge distribution and ask is it 0 or non-zero. If it is non-zero, then I say there is a net charge in my charge distribution and the dominant term in my multipole expansion is the monopole term which goes as Q by R. And next I compute this quantity. So, I take this element of charge rho of r prime d, d tau prime and I multiply it by the position vector of that volume element and then do the integral over the whole volume and of course by definition I will get a vector and the potential due to this will now go as 1 over r square. So, it is entirely possible that for a given charge distribution, the net charge is 0, but the dipole moment is non-zero, in which case this V0 is 0, but V1 is non-zero. Maybe there is another case where you can find that V0 is 0 and the dipole moment is also 0, then you cannot say that every potential is 0. I have to compute the next term. Look at V2. Of course, the definition of V2 is more complicated and I am not going to do it and in fact we are not going to do it in this course. But in principle I can compute V2 based on the expansion that I wrote down and I will check if V0 and V1 are 0, check if V2 is non-zero 
and if v2 is non zero then that is the dominant term in my potential and that will go as r q it's also possible that v2 is also zero i can't say potential is zero i have to go to v3 and check whether v3 is non zero so i mean i have i mean i don't know if you have dealt with series expansions in a mathematics course i have let us say a series sum of f of x which is f not plus f1 x plus f2 x square plus dot 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 it's an infinite series so this is sum over n equal to 0 to infinity fn x power n when can you say f of x is 0 for f of x to be 0 i mean for f of x to be identically 0 that is what i mean for all values of x for all values of x if you want f x to be 0 i need f not to be 0 f 1 to be 0 f 2 to be 0 f 3 to be 0 and every single coefficient in this exp expansion all the way up to the highest powers every single coefficient has to be 0 only then i can say that f of x equal to 0 for all values of x so same argument here what i have is a series expansion in 1 over r and this will vanish for all values of r only if all the multiple moments are zero otherwise you it's not possible and the only case where all the multiple moments are zero except of course the monopole is when you have a perfectly spherical charge distribution if i have a rho of r which is which depends only on r and nothing else then it does not depend on any angles since it doesn't depend on any angles all the all the legendre polynomials integral will become zero and so whatever that spherical charge distribution gives you for its uh, monopole term that will be the potential and maybe it is you can arrange it in such a way that maybe zero to a you have positive charge and a to 2a you have negative charge so that net charge is zero in which case you can in principle have potential zero for uh, potential exactly equal to zero because you have deliberately designed the charge density such that all the multiple moments are zero but for a general charge distribution you cannot ever say that the potential is zero first you are expected to calculate the monopole term if it is not zero fine you can stop there of course if you are asked to do the calculation to 1% or 0.1% or 0.01% accuracy then you may have to consider the additional terms but as a rule of thumb if the total charge is non zero we stop at the monopole term and say the potential is q by r if total charge is zero then we look at the dipole moment if the dipole moment is non zero we say okay potential goes as dipole moment by r square and we'll stop there if the dipole moment is also zero then we go to quadrupole moment and 
If that is non-zero, we'll stop there. If quadrupole moment is also zero, we'll go to V3, and that is called octopole moment, and that will be the leading term. And this is going as one over R, this is going as one over R square, the quadrupole term goes as one over R cube, and the octopole term goes as one over R power four. Also, let us look at each of the multipole terms. The monopole term is the total charge, which is a scalar, whereas the dipole is a vector. So, what will the quadrupole be? It is a tensor and octopole moment will be a tensor of order 3 and on and on. And in fact, by extension, you can call a vector to be a tensor of order 1 and a scalar to be a tensor of order 0. Uh, I will indulge in a little bit of digression and sort of give you a motivation for how the tensors arise. The first quantitative problem you do is sort of motion in one dimension. So, you have a particle moving along the line or a particle falling vertically down. You apply Newton's second law and you derive various relations between its uh, initial velocity, final velocity, distance traveled, etc., etc. But once you extend the notion from motion in one dimension to motion in two dimensions, this description of measuring everything in terms of a simple scalar is not enough, because you need to specify how far you have traveled and also in which direction you have traveled. So, that is how you get the notion of a vector, but tensor comes in when you consider more complicated motions. For example, especially you consider rotation of a rigid body. So, this duster is a rigid body. By rigid body, I mean if I apply a force on it or if I apply a torque on it, it does not change shape. It remains the same. Now, you have done rotations of rigid body, but you have done rotations of rigid body only for rotations about a symmetry axis. So, this is a symmetry axis for this rigid body. If I rotate it about it, you can write the simple equation angular momentum is equal to where this moment of inertia, you are treating it as a scalar. That is because the angular momentum and the omega, they are in the same direction when the rotation is about the axis of symmetry. By the way, this is not the definition of angular momentum. Definition of angular momentum is
are strictly speaking you think of the rigid body as being made up of small mass points and each mass point will have a position vector and it has a momentum vector. So, you calculate r cross p for that mass, mass point and sum over all the mass points and that is what gives you the angular momentum of a rigid body. And if the rotation is about a symmetric axis, then this definition simplifies into this definition. But now let me consider rotation through the same point, but it is no longer a symmetric axis. So, this is my z axis and I have omega about the z axis, but I am rotating it like this. If I do so, if you work it out and in fact, you should actually try to do it. You take a sort of a foot long cylinder, thin foot long cylinder and try to make it rotate about a axis which is at an angle compared to its direction and you can feel that L omega is still omega z hat, but L is not L z hat. You will find that L has a component in the x y plane. So, how do we get that component? In order to do that, we need to we need to make this object more complicated and in fact, we define what is called And so, to describe this, let us think of omega is a vector. So, I think of it as a column matrix omega x, omega y, omega z. L is also a vector. I think of it as L x, L y and L z. And what is the most general transformation which takes me from one column matrix to another column matrix? It is a 3 by 3 matrix. So, the object the most general in the most general case the object that appears here is a 3 by 3 matrix and that is what we call a tensor of order 2. And now it is diffi difficult to write it down in this notation, but now you can imagine a tensor of order 3 it will be a 3 by 3 matrix, another 3 by 3 matrix here, another 3 by 3 matrix here with some 27 objects. That is a tensor of order 3 and that is what the octopole moment will be. And if you want to go to even higher orders, you can think of tensor of order 4, order 5, blah, 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 blah. And I believe half the class here are mechanical engineers. So, you will all do a course on elasticity and you all have heard of 
Young's modulus. Young's modulus is what? We say stress by strain. What is stress? Force by area or I write vector here, vector here. So, this is a tensor of order 2. And similarly, you will find strain is also a tensor of order 2. And if you want to write Young's modulus, stress which is tensor of order 2 is Young's modulus times strain which is tensor of order 2. So, this is a tensor of order 4. See, tensor of order 1 connecting to tensor of order 1, proportionality is tensor of order 2. Tensor of order 2 connecting to tensor of order 2, proportionality is tensor of order 4. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I have not discussed this, but we do it by the number of indices that we need to specify. For example, this equation also can be written as Li is equal to Iij omega j. Have you seen equations like this? No. So, tensor of order 1, I use, describe by using one index. Tensor of order 0, no indices, that is a scalar. Tensor of order 1 has one index and I goes over 1, 2, 3. And similarly, here only one index, J goes over 1, 2, 3. But this 3 by 3 matrix, it has two indices. There is a column index and a row index. So, I goes over 1, 2, 3, J goes over 1, 2, 3. And when an index is repeated, it is assumed that it is summed over. Now, so tensor of order 3 will carry 3 indices. Tensor of order 4 will carry 4 indices tensor of order 5 will carry 5 indices and dot dot dot. So, extension is quite natural, but up to tensor of order 2, we actually use the matrix form, but if you go to tensor of order 3, you cannot use matrix form, but all of you, I hope you have done some programming, so you know the concept of an array. So, tensor of order 3 is nothing but a 3 dimensional array, tensor of order 4 is nothing but a 4 dimensional array, etcetera, etcetera. Finally, I will do one last thing before stopping. So, let us get back to the multipole moments. We have this form for potential of a dipole and the fact that there is a dipole moment defined means that the charge distribution has a direction defined within it and I take that direction to be the z axis. So, I take p vector to be p scalar times z hat. then this dipole potential is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught p cos theta by r square and given the potential 
we can easily calculate the electric field. So, electric field of course is gradient of V1 and the radial component is 1 over 2 pi epsilon naught 2 p cos theta by r square and the theta component is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught p sin theta by so you see that for the same distance the electric field is twice as strong along the direction of the dipole compared to perpendicular to the dipole. Oh, sorry. R cube. And so the monopole electric field falls off as 1 over r square as you move away from the charge and the dipole electric field falls off as 1 over r cube as I move away from the chart and you can imagine a quadrupole electric field falls off as 1 over r power 4 as I move away from the chart etc etc. So the same pattern also repeats but the explicit form of the electric field now is more complicated and we need to work it out for term by term. So, I will stop now and uh, in the next class we will start our discussion of magnetism.